Well, you got people who get accused of something. They may not have done it, but because they don't have extra thousand dollars laying around, they get a ten thousand dollar bail. He can't go nowhere. He got to sit in jail for three, four, five weeks. He may have a job, a family, a car, come out, charges get dropped, but he don't have nothing. Now he's homeless. Go. <laughs> Welcome back to the Broken Home Podcast. Thank you all for joining us. Tonight, we have a special one. The godfather of West Coast hip-hop, Lonzo Williams. How you doing tonight, Lonzo? Doing fantastic, man. I got to chill out my folks. Just hanging like a chandelier, just trying to shine. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. World-class wrecking crew. You found them. Tell us about them. What was that like? I created World-class wrecking crew. After um, I did some shows with uh, groups like Curtis Blow and Run DMC at Eve After Dark, I was already making records. I was making underground mixes. I was taking uh, mixes that Yella and Dre would mix and turn them into records and sell them into swap meets, record stores, whatever the case may be. So I was already in the, with the, familiar with the process of making records. And uh, after doing some shows with Run DMC, and he, Ron broke my mic because he got a habit of doing that mic drop thing. Broke my damn mic, 15-minute show, $500, uh, airplanes, hotels, and then they wouldn't play for my competition the next night. Kind of pissed me off. So I said, I'm going to start my own damn group. And clientele had won. Yellow was already there. Clientele had won a, con a rap contest, and Dre came in a little bit later. And uh, I just said, let's, let's, let's do something. And nobody believes we can do it, but we started doing it anyway. It started working, and uh, next thing you know, Greg Mack came to town, and we had records on the radio, and we were doing, we started doing our thing, man. It was just a, a a perfect storm, basically. It was a perfect storm. What was the local reception to the world class wrecking crew? Everybody feeling it right off the hop? Well, we we were local celebrities already because of Eve After Dark. The Eve had all of our names buzzing, and as the wrecking crew, we really were buzzing. You know, people knew us already. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like a big surprise. We were playing our records in the club. The original name was Wrecking Crew. And everybody knew the Wrecking Crew from playing, you know, playing their high school dances and doing the Eve After Dark and doing the big parties in the city of LA, Queen Mary, a convention center. When we changed it from world from our Wrecking Crew to world class, you know, it was a it was a natural evolution. It was a legal situation and it was a just a natural evolution. And it just, you know, it never, we never missed a beat. Were you guys getting requests to go to, to different cities or was it mainly just L.A. based? We rocked L.A. based with K-Day for about eh, about a year or so. Then we hooked up with McCola Records and McCola was selling our records out of this, out of state and we didn't know it. Then we started getting calls to do shows. Like, how the hell you get up here about us? We got your record from McCola. Oh, so next thing you know, we are, we're in a, on a plane, a bus, a van, whatever it was. To get to, to get to where it was to get the money. Back then, it was basically just word of mouth. Now you could put anything anywhere, and someone is going to see it. How was the like the challenge back then of getting the name out? Because we started off locally, it was a lot more labor intensive because we had to hang up posters, pass out flyers, do all that kind of stuff. Shortly after that, when when radio picked us up, when K Day picked us up, we blew up. You know, we got a bigger territory far as uh, our records locally. And then when we started, uh, McCola started doing his little thing. We started expanding glo I mean, nationally. So it, it, it kind of just it grew organically because at that time, wasn't a lot of hip hop, wasn't a lot of dance hip hop or anything like that. So anything that would sound good pretty much got action. And we, we didn't have a lot of competition back then. And it just worked for us. It was, like I said, it was the perfect storm. How much did it cost to make a record? Overall cost. Man, to make a record back then cost at least about three to four thousand dollars. When we first went into the studio, the reason why we were able to go to the studio, we knew a guy named Daniel Sofer. He had an Oberheim production uh, system, which consisted of a DMX drum machine, an OB8 uh, key, uh, keyboard, and a DS, uh, DS, DSX sequencer. And he knew how to play, play, he could play the instruments and he knew how to lock everything together. And he was charging like 150 a beat. OK, and studio time, you know, if you walk into the studio like they do now, studio time may cost you a grip because studio time at that time was between 40 and 50 an hour plus the engineer. 
you know, you can rack up some bills real fast. Then after you do all that, you got to go, you got to get it mastered and then you got to get it plated. And that's some more money. That's four or $500. Then you got to get the plates made. Once you get the plates made, that's another two or three hundred dollars. And then you got to get labels. That's another two or three hundred. So depending on what you are doing, I'm going to bring it down to about twenty five hundred, man, twenty five hundred. And then you got your test presses. So once you get your test presses, that's another. Uh, usually they charge you. They, they charge you for your first. Uh, they give you five test presses to check them out. From that point on, it's like a dollar fifty a record, dollar to a dollar fifty a record. And were you ever looking to like, hey, to, to hell with taking studio time? I'd like to have my own studio. Go to and- studio immediately. I, I I've owned several studios. When you saw Straight Outta Compton, the movie, they, they were re- re- recreating one of my studios. I had a studio in my garage. I built a four track uh, initially, a little small four track to do all our demos in. And then as the money got better, I built. I got a sit a twelve track and a sixteen track. And um, that was how we did all our demos. And then we take them to the 24 track and dump it. And that saved a lot of money because now you got time to make mistakes. Back then, we didn't have cut and paste on a digital format. You had to, when you wanted to cut something, you had to get a razor blade and cut it. Okay. <laughs> you want to paste it, you needed some tape. It was not like it is now. So uh, to make mistakes, to do what you, to do what we do, to make stuff, to, to reverse stuff. If you had to cut it, we use a uh, half inch tape and reverse it, cut it out, reverse it. And then, and that's how you, that's how you begin foo, 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 as opposed to boom, boom. Okay. It, it just, it just was a whole manual process, nothing digitized. And it just made for an interesting experience overall, man. Can your ear pick up produced music old fashioned like that versus the digital now? Can you hear that difference in it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, you know, one thing was kind of disappointing for me as a music producer to have the all this technology at your disposal and nobody uses it really to its fullest to its fullest potential. That for me is kind of disturbing. I mean, I grew up on big bands. I mean, you know, Cameo was a big band at one time. Cameo had eight people in there. Uh, George Clinton, you know, Parliament Funkadelics. These guys had horns and multiple strings, whatever the case may be. And to see people have all these, all this instrumentation at the, literally at their fingertips only to confine themselves with the same basic sounds is kind of disappointing. And you can, you can actually create an orchestra. I mean, if somebody really has a musical talent, they could actually, man, they could blow this shit up to another level, dude. But it's just, you know, nobody wants to take the time to really hone the, the musical skills necessary or even bring somebody in that knows what they're doing now, then I'm, I'm gonna say something slick that's why the music is so disposable because it's, it's nothing for people to grab onto yes and that's what made wu-tang so special because rizza he took advantage of those instruments he learned how to play them himself and See? he brought that in i was listening to a song yesterday by a friend of mine from the poetess og poetess he did her raps they had a live upright bass player in the studio i mean this dude's Doom, 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 doom. He's rocking this up. You know, that's what made hip hop hip hop back then, man. Because people would experiment with sound and bring in things that nobody else would do. You know, Quick even brought a banjo in one time to do some stuff on some of his tracks. I mean, damn, he put, he put an effect on the banjo, but that banjo, that's a funky ass banjo. Okay. So <laughs> even, when you, this is what makes music fun. I tell any, anybody I give a speech to, man, uh, a, a studio is a laboratory. It's like any other laboratory. You can mix this chemical with this chemical and it might blow up and it might, you know, it might turn into some shit, you know, that can save the world. You don't know that until you try it. And to see people get so stuck on auto-tune and just certain things is just really disappointing, especially in this technological age. A a lot of these people, do you think, are kind of leaning on these things as crutches, like auto-tune? Yeah, yeah. I mean, but here's the problem. And most of the time when you go to a concert, you can't reproduce that shit. You can't reproduce that shit. So now you got to use your real voice to, to <laughs> I mean, I don't sound nothing like you. So, you know, you've been going through these machines and then, you know, and most of the people too cheap to buy the machines because most of the machines are affordable. You can actually buy that, but you got to take somebody with you now to work your damn thing. No, they don't want to pay for that. I mean, even the wrecking crew, when we did our stuff, we, we did juice. Um, I carried a vocoder with us everywhere we went. You know, even right now, we do shows from time to time. I have a, vo- a vocoder that is 
ready to go do juice. So you'll still get that same robotic sound that we gave you in juice. That's awesome. So speaking about the world-class wrecking crew, how did that evolve to NWA? What was the reasoning behind that? Well, the original uh, reason was uh, reality rap was starting to take place, take take root here on the West Coast with Tidy T, Mixmaster Spade. Dre had been exposed to Run DMC through Eve After Dark. And he, Dre, didn't, he never liked rehearsing. He never liked rehearsing. And he 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 wanted to move. He, they wanted to change the image from the the fancy clothes to the to the uh, Lee jeans and the tennis shoes, which was not a terrible was not a terrible idea because we eventually we did make some changes. But because we were one of the first rap groups on the West Coast, and we played with mostly R and B groups, we didn't play with a lot of rap groups. People keep forgetting about that. We did not play with we didn't open with a lot of rap groups till later on. So you open it up with groups like Surface. Midnight Star, More Standard Time, Mary Jane Girls. You can't walk out there with a pair of jeans on and grab your nuts talking shit. They don't want to see that. Uh, we kind of complied with the with the style of the time because we were we we were a kind of an R and B rap group, R and B hip hop group. It you know people always kind of clowned us a little bit, but it, that's what that that was the road we had to hold to get to where everybody else went. And eventually, uh, with the popularity of the more street rap. Dre was going to, the original plan was he was going to produce world-class wrecking crew and NWA and NWA took off and it, you know, it just, uh, things changed. Things evolved. Yeah. When it came to the reality rap, there was only a few people locally that were doing it. How were the locals taken to it? Was it like something like mind blowing to them at that time? Like they're actually talking about how we're living. It was real local for a while. Tiny T's, uh, Battery Ram probably was the big, biggest record. Miss Master Spade had a, a nice little local hit. And I guess Dre wanted to experiment with that. And it just, you know, it made for the times were changing. And I tell people sometimes this is when the evolution of, of music really made a uh, started to have an impact. Because, you know, when you look at Wrecking Crew and then half of Wrecking Crew become NWA. I mean, these we were all DJs. We were all DJs. I've been DJing for over 45 years myself. So that's how I got to the Eve After Dark prior to being world-class wrecking crew, prior to meeting Dre and Cube and Easy. I mean, any of them. I was a DJ here in LA. Then I became a, a club owner slash DJ. The, the hustle and the format of the music at that time was always dance music. We were not into the gangster rap. You know, there was no gangster rap. There was no reason to support that. And when the 84, 85 drug trade became a big um, commodity in the inner city, that kind of changed the streets. So people went from partying so much to more into the street life. And that's what the money became because our money came from giving parties. Our money didn't come from dope. My money, ne my, my money never came from dope. So, and everybody, including Easy e was a dance promoter. He had a, he had a dance promotion company called High Power Production. I saw him and Dre were hooking up at. That's how Easy was always trying to figure out what I was doing. He was that was the hustle of that time, giving dances and parties, and to make the music for people to dance to only made sense. But at, like I said, as the street changed, I didn't want to change because I was already comfortable in my style. Plus, I knew at my age at that time I could not just all of a sudden pull up my nine gang banging roots and become a gang banger at 29 years old. That's not going to make sense. How are you going to be a rookie gang banger at 29? I would look like a damn idiot. So I had to step away from that and pass on that, on that situation. You mentioned Batteram. I think Batteram was one of the first times that people actually got a glimpse of what was taking place in LA when it came to the police, the crash unit, because Batteram is based off of that big tank, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It had a, literally had a tank with a with a flat plate on it on the on the barrel of the tank. They put a plate on the front of it, and if they figured out your house was a dope uh, a dope house, they come tear the side of your goddamn wall off. Okay, because what happened is that a lot of the houses became fortified. Once the dope houses became fortified, the cops would try and tear them down with their conventional methods, and they couldn't get in in time. The dope would get flushed, they get you know, dipped in acid or whatever the case may be. Some guys they had it so slick. They would shoot. They would just have an underground tunnel made to the house next door, and the dope would go next door. So when they get there, ain't no dope. So wow. the, 
you know, if, if you got five or ten minutes to uh, get to the stash room and stash all the drugs, the cops, you know, their efforts just became fruitless. Nobody goes to jail. And the, and the, and the cops knew the guy who was selling dope, but they couldn't get in the houses fast enough. So they said, you know what? That's when they came up to no-knock warrants. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to knock. We're just going to tear down the goddamn side of the house and just go in there and just start getting shit. And they always did it early in the morning, like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. And everybody was asleep. Business was slow. And But the only problem was, every once in a while, it run over somebody. Because you come to the wall, you don't know who's sleeping where. And yeah. they think about that part. So you can't just run over people, kill people in the house, because you want to get some dope. The, the per, People's lives supersede dope. At least that's the illusion. When it comes to the 70s transitioning into the late 80s, what was the gang scene there? 90s had the gang wars. What was that buildup coming up to that? Growing up in the 70s, you had tough guys, you had gangs, but they didn't have they weren't funded. They were never funded like they were in the 80s. Most of the gangsters that I knew, they would rob, they would rob the grocery store or stuff like that. Or, or you know, they, that's what they that was, that's that's what they would do. They would rob stuff. They would break into uh, clothing stores or rob the grocery store, or that's how they would get their money. And then they didn't really bother any non-gangsters like myself. We all knew each other. They looked at us differently. I ain't going to say they looked down. They looked at us differently, okay? Uh, if they were planning something or plotting something, they would run us off. Hey, get out of here. This ain't, this ain't for you, you know? Every once in a while, I had I had access to a car young. I would drop guys off. Hey, man, we, we need a ride. I did, what you going to do? No, I didn't your damn business. We just need a ride, okay? They would not let you be involved in that stuff. They knew that wasn't for you. So do you hear later on, man, told them, they went over to the so-and-so hood and did, did, did they really? And, you you know, you wonder if you're involved. But, again, because they were, it was a different caliber and different breed, you know, and nah, he, we, we we walked over there, you know, whatever the case may be. So even the gangsters, man, would protect the non-gangsters. I, I remember one time, distinctively, I was in ninth grade, and this was right at the time they were taking leather jackets. A waistline leather jacket was a guaranteed ass whooping, guaranteed ass whooping, okay? And I'm sitting outside. My buddy had a, he, he went to one school. He couldn't wear it to his school at all. But where I lived at, I lived right down the street from my school. I figured I could wear this jacket to school, and if somebody got after me, I could get home before they got me too good. And, man, just so happened I'm talking to this girl, and next thing I know, I'm in a damn choke a choke lock. Guy got me hooked up. Give me the coat. Give me, oh, shit. I can't, can't get away. And uh, I'm buttoning the coat. And I'm buttoning. I'm buttoning, talking at the same time. Just so happened, just so happened, my neighborhood gangster walked up and saw the saw another gangster trying to take my coat. He says, "Hey man, you can't take his coat, man." Oh man, I'm taking. No, you can't take his coat, man. And why not? Because I said so. That's my boy. You can't take his coat. Now they were going to square off over me. Okay, my my dude said, "Man, you can't do that to him. I know him. I like him. He's a good dude. You can't take his goddamn coat. And if you don't let it go, me and you got a problem." Homeboy let me go, and they talked about it. Now, my partner told me to get out of here. This ain't your business no more. Take that goddamn coat off. And that's how they did us back in the day. They gave us a, it gave us a pass on being ignorant. They looked out for us. So it wasn't all about it. But, you know, but again, if I needed a ride, to, if he needed a ride to the store, or, if, you know, if he did, hey, man, I got you, okay? And it just, it just made for a different era, man, period. Yeah, and then it got so bad that the police had to start doing uh, dirty tactics there to take the gangbangers off the streets because civilians were dying left and right. When did that start to change? When did the, the civilians start getting wrapped up into everything? When the automatic weapons came into the play, because now you got guys who have territories who have making, I mean, tens of thousands dollars of dollars a week. And you may cost another crew money because you got a better dope sack than they do. And to get you off that block, they'll roll past and start shooting at people. And, uh, and unfortunately, an AK-47 or whatever they're shooting does not, you know, they have a nice recoil. So you may be shooting at one person. If you don't know what you're doing, plus you're moving in a car, angles change. It don't take but a, a micro millimeter of an angle to change and you miss the person you're shooting at 
and here's somebody sitting in the living room watching television. And that's when it got really crazy. People people got tired of innocent people dying over somebody else's somebody else's situation. Dude, I'm in my room watching television and your kid get killed because two two assholes are having a fight over t- territory. No, man. And that's how that's how laws like three strikes got passed. You know, when I look, when I look at all the youngsters still doing dumb stuff in Chicago, uh, Atlanta, and even sometimes in LA, I tell them, I say, keep on. They have loosened the laws so much, they've almost given free reign to a lot of stupid activity. But one thing about one thing I do know about the American legal system, they'll give you a whole lot of rope to hang yourself. But when they get through, they're gonna put a noose on your ass. You can't get out of, you know, it's like three strikes. It, it went from wild buck wild streets to three strikes. People going to jail over stealing pizza. Life in prison behind pizza. Now people people have spent the last 25, 30 years getting those laws uh, adjusted. Now they've made things so so lax to you can legally, you can actually walk into a store in America right now and steal up to $1,000 worth of stuff and the security guard can't even stop you. If the, if the clerk or the manager called the cop, they won't even come out. The DA won't even prosecute. If it's under $1,000, it won't, they won't even prosecute. It won't even uh, prosecute. So you got people walking into stores, going shopping, and just walking out. That's bad for business. Very. That's yeah. bad for business. But at some point in time, because what happened, they, had, they, they, they decided that the uh, bail laws were too strenuous. Well, you got people who get accused of something. They may not have done it, but because they don't have uh, an extra thousand dollars laying around, they get a ten thousand dollar bail. He can't go nowhere. He got to sit in jail for three, four, five weeks. He may have a job, a family, a car. Come out, charges get dropped, but he don't have nothing. Now he's homeless. Scenarios like that were happening so much it was ridiculous. So, and even if they did do something, was it worth it? it was the weight in jail worth them losing everything they had for the crime that they committed. So sometimes waiting to go to jail will cost you cost you more than being convicted of the crime. Because sometimes by the time you go to court, you got time served. But when you get out, you ain't got nothing. Your car's been repossessed. Your woman is screwing your friend. Your kids don't know you no more. And everybody's all messed up. Then they loosened it up so much till now, like I said, you can pretty much walk in the stores and do what you want to with little to no repercussions. So crazy. It's not like that up here in Canada, but criminals have been getting away with a lot more. You actually are starting to see some people doing these brazen things like that, walking into these shops, pulling out $500, $600 worth of merchandise and just walking off like it ain't a thing. But it's not as prominent up here yet that it is down down south, though. It, it, it's, it's amazing, man. I've ran nightclubs forever. Anything entertainment I've been in, involved in, I had a situation one time and I, I had to go to court behind us. Uh, somebody got killed in one of my clubs and they were saying that the uh, security guard didn't do their jobs. After the case was over with, I talked to a security guard consultant, a security consultant, which I should have did before I went to the case. But come to find out, a security guard can't do much of anything. A security guard, their job is to observe and report. Anytime a security guard gets into a physical confrontation with a person that he is not, he or she has not been attacked by that person, you are, you're on your own. You're not working for the company no more. If you see somebody stealing something, it's not your job to stop them from stealing the stuff. It's not your job. Your job is to report it, get the license plate number, call the police. Just lot professional of, eyeballs. Professional eyeballs. A lot of a lot of security guards think because you have a badge and possibly a gun that you are that you just blow a cop. No, you're not. You're just above a citizen with a gun and a badge. And I realize how useless they really are, even at a bank. Unless that guy is unless unless the security guard sees uh, somebody has a gun to the head of a customer or something like that, and he and if he miss if he shoot and miss, he on his own. <laughs> The bank do bank ain't covering that. So you know you really you really um, give a false illusion of what security guards what he can do. When did the police start with the black community hard in L.A. 
from birth shit. <laughs> so it was always like that then. Dude, I remember as a as a baby, maybe eight or nine years old. I never I never forget. Uh, my grandmother lived in LA and her next door neighbor bought a brand new Ford Galaxy 500 convertible. He bought it on a Friday, drove it to work, and he was out Saturday night and the cops beat his ass because he had a new car. The cops beat his ass. See, man, what, what happened? I was riding in the street, cops put me over, and they just beat my ass because I had a new car. Beat him, beat, beat the shit out of him. And then That's my insane. dad. My dad had bought a, a Cadillac shortly after that, and what he would do every time he had to go to certain parts of town, he made sure the kids was in the car with him. There's a city between uh, right near right near Compton called Linwood, and Linwood was predominantly all white town, and Linwood was always been been patrolled by the sheriff department. And before they had the they had they had the freeway running between L.A. and Linwood, we had to go up a street called Imperial Highway. And Imperial Highway was always patrolled by the, by the sheriff. And dude, that was like a no-fly zone for many a black man, dude. And we had to go to Sears and Roebuck on Long Beach Boulevard. The only way to get there, the fastest way to get there was up, up Imperial Highway. My dad would be nervous. He'd be sit, you know, sit, stayed up in the seat because he knew he never got he never had a problem. Cause my dad was never, he never was an asshole. You know, he never would talk shit to the police. He was always a smart guy when it came to dealing, dealing with the cops. But yeah, even myself as a young man uh, driving, you know, being a uh, part-time low rider, I mean, the cops will pull us over for nothing. Take everything out your trunk, everything out your, your seats out, your back seats would come out, have your hood open, looking for shit. The, the uh, air filter cover be sitting on the ground. Your you sitting on the car, your hands, Leaning on this hot ass hood of the police car, your fingertips are baking like hot dogs on a grill. And they don't find shit. Oh, okay, you can go now. It'll take you 20 minutes to put your car back together. I mean, they would, um, back then we had eight tracks. They would dump them all out on the street, man. Just dump them out. Just dump them out for no reason. I mean, they would do this shit today. They would see you every other day. They would see you on a regular basis. They stop you at least once or twice a week. They know where you live at. They know who you are. And they still do this. It, they would stop me in front of my house. They would get me in front of my house, man. In front of my house. And this is why at, at a young age, I had a I couldn't stand the police, man. And I couldn't stand the police. I understand some of their philosophies. Now that I'm grown, growing up in, the, in where I grew up, the police were not our friend at all. Never, never.